Let me go ahead and encourage you today, if you have your Bibles, if not, there should be a Bible in front of you in the pew, but if you have your Bibles today, I want to encourage you to turn with me to the New Testament. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts, and I'm going to have as our foundational text, uh, Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 33 through 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 33 through 42. At this time, Jesus has already been put on the cross. Jesus has been put in the grave, and he has risen on the third day, just as he said he would. Jesus has ascended into heaven, and he has given out before then a great commission for those that were his followers, those that were his disciples, for them to go out and to proclaim, to preach the gospel to all corners of the world. And they took that very serious. And so they go out and they preach and they begin to preach in the marketplace. They preach in the synagogues. They preach anywhere that there was someone at. They would let someone know because their belief was is that Jesus said go do it and they wanted to be obedient and they applied it to their daily life. When they believed that Jesus was coming back, in fact what they did they thought he could be coming back any moment. And Jesus can come back any moment. And here what they would do is they had a sense of urgency in preaching the gospel. I think after 2,000 years, we probably have lost a sense of urgency about getting the gospel out. But my friends, even though Jesus might seem like he has tarried and Jesus has not come back on our time frame, I will let you know this. Jesus knows exactly the day and the hour, even when we don't know. And it's good that we don't know exactly when. But what we do know this is because Jesus says he's coming back and there's never been a promise in the Bible that he has broken, that he will return. And so we have a man by the name of Peter who while Jesus was walking the earth and Jesus was ministering with Peter, Peter was up and down and all around in his faith. You remember Peter one day would have great faith and the next day it seems like Peter would doubt and Peter had a sense of an emotional instability. He cut off the ear of one of the chief high priest guards. He was someone who denied Jesus three times. But yet Peter's also when the one when he found out that Jesus has risen from the dead, he and John, they run to the tomb because they wanted to see where Jesus was. Peter had a sense of passion for Christ. And even more whenever he realized that Jesus had rose from the dead. Peter's passion for Jesus intensified. You see, when you have a personal encounter with the living Lord, your passion for him will be intensified. I've been asked at times, Pastor, why are there some believers that are not passionate for the Savior? And my answer to that is because they've not ever had a personal encounter with Jesus. They've read about him. They've heard him sung about. They've gone to Sunday school. They've gone to preaching. They might even went and said a few words that made it sound like they knew who Jesus was. They knew the lingo, but they never had a personal encounter with Jesus. If we have an encounter with Jesus, oh, it will make us passionate. There's been sermons that I've preached about Jesus and the Holy Spirit was so strong wrong at that moment that the only thing I could do was open my Bible and instead of preaching a sermon I have literally had in the past my pages of my scripture covered in tears where the Holy Spirit was humbling me because I needed to go to the Lord and I needed to get more passionate about him and there's nothing wrong with that I'm thankful that God will stir us and convict us to be more passionate for him but we need to understand that Peter, when we come to Acts chapter 5, and hopefully by now you have that text, when we come to Acts chapter 5, Peter has been going and preaching the good news. And he's also been letting them know that the people of that time, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, that they are the ones that were responsible for Jesus' death. They had blood on their hands. And many of you know that when we start preaching about joy and happiness and we start preaching about things being abundant in mercy, oh, people don't mind hearing sermons about that. But when you start preaching sermons about what's going on in their own backyard, when you start talking about what's going on in their own closet, and when you start talking about what their kids are doing or what they are doing or their spouse is doing, sometimes people get mad and say, I don't want to hear that kind of sermon. I want to feel good. The problem we have in the modern day church is we've got too many pastors that are getting up making people feel good instead of people being under conviction of the Holy Spirit. My friends, you can feel good all the way to the gates of hell 
And my friends, if you do this, understand this, feeling good is not the same as knowing you're saved. Now, when you are saved, you can feel good because you know your sins have been forgiven. And you want to share that with someone. You want to let someone know that. And here we have exactly that. So Peter goes and he preaches. He's been arrested for it. The angel of the Lord has let him out of the cell. He comes out of the cell and guess what? He keeps on preaching and he's about to get arrested again and brought before the Sanhedrin. So that gets us to the point of today's text in Acts chapter 5 starting with verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. This is the Sanhedrin wanting to kill Peter, kill the other disciples, anyone that was getting up, preaching the gospel. They were so convicted that instead of surrendering their life to God, their conviction drove them to want to drive all aspects of Christianity and Christ himself and his message out. You see, there's only one of two options that will take place when the gospel is preached. We will boldly accept it and be transformed, or when we hear the gospel preached, our hearts will be hard and cold, and we will reject it and not only attack the gospel, but attack the one who proclaims the gospel. These people here, these Sanhedrin, were religious They knew the scriptures. These people here, they knew what it meant to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These people here had facts, but they had no faith. And here what we see is that because of what Peter was saying, the true message of the cross, that they want him dead. It says in verse 34, Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel. Now Gamaliel is interesting because his Hebrew name is this, is that God is the one who provides. God is the one who is there. God is the comforter. So his name is based on an idea of God's majesty. And Gamaliel is a member of the Sanhedrin party. And Gamaliel is going to know what's taking place. He's a leader at that time. Gamaliel is interesting because when Gamaliel finds out they have arrested Peter and they've arrested some of the other disciples, he's going to get up and he's going to try to convince the other Sanhedrin not to kill these disciples. Now let's look at him and see what he says. A Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin... And he ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. The reason why is because what he's about to say, he does not want Peter and others to hear it. He wants to talk one-on-one with his fellow Sanhedrin members. It's kind of like a private business meeting. You know how churches have church conference sometimes. Now, if you're not a member, you, you, you can will in the stay, but we're about to do church business, and most people, they'll get up and leave if they're not a member because they're like, well, that has nothing to do with me. Well, that's what's taking place here is that Sanhedrin is having a church business meeting. And the business meeting is about killing followers of Christ. And so Gamaliel stands up and he has Peter and those to leave. And he says this in verse 35. He said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're going to do to these men. Thank God that the Spirit of God convicted him enough to say the truth. Be careful what you're about to do. You see, I want to say this to the world. When the world starts attacking the church, whenever we see, like in California, the governor there says that you go to church, but you cannot sing. When you see lunacy taking place every single day where Christianity is under attack, I think that someone needs to be told, be careful what you do to those people called Christians. You know, whenever the church has been persecuted, when the church has been beaten down, when the church has been run down, that's when the church starts getting strong. We are like a sleeping giant. We are like a sleeping lion. And many of us need to realize it's time to wake up before all our rights have completely been stripped from us. You see, today we are not even at full capacity And we're doing everything we can to preach the gospel because we're more afraid of what a virus or disease will do than what we are about the power of Christ. It says that not long that Thaddeus rose up, so now Gamaliel is going to give them an example, two examples of why they should just let it go. He says that there was a man named Thaddeus. He rose up claiming to be somebody. And a group of about 400 men, they rallied with him. He was killed. 
and all his uh, people that were part of it, taking place of it, were dispersed and dispensed, and they came, it came to nothing. In verse 37, after this, a man named Judas of Galilean rose up that day, and he was against the census, and he attracted a following. That man also perished, and all his parishioners, those that were following with him, they were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. He continues, For if the plan or the work of these men is to be overthrown, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You will not, it says, and you may even be found fighting against God. Gamaliel says, if what they're doing is not in order, if what they're doing is against God, it's going to fall apart. Just step back and let them destroy themselves. But Gamaliel says, if it is God, you better be careful because what we are doing by going after them and willing to kill them is that then we are going to have God to deal with. Notice this man makes a lot of sense. And so they listen to him. And, and earlier it says that Gamaliel, if you remember the, what I read, it says Gamaliel was respected by all. It's not just all of the Sanhedrin. He was respected by everyone in that area. And now do you see why? He makes a lot of sense, and they listen to him. And it says that in verse 40, after they called in the apostles and they had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they released them. Now stop there. The writer of Acts is Luke. Luke is a physician. He was the personal doctor of the apostle Paul. He traveled with Paul many of his missionary journeys. Luke writes this, and notice Luke many times he gives a lot of detail, especially medical details. When you read the Gospel of Luke and you read about the blind man, you find out how long he's been blind, you find out what was going on. But Luke does something that I thought was a little odd here. Luke says in writing this, he says the following. He says that they were let back in, they were told not to preach the Gospel, and they were flogged and let go. You see... It makes it sound like the flogging was no big deal. I want to let you know what flogging is. Flogging is one or two ways. They would either take a whip that would have broken glass. It would have either stone. It would have some type of metal. It would have some type of bone in that whip tied into it. And they would hit that person amount of times. And it would rip their flesh. It would beat them on their back. Jesus was beaten. If you remember, he was tied naked down to a stump and they beat him. And when you talk about being flogged, it's not something that's just a gentle spanking. This is truly a barbaric act that many had died from. And so they beat them with either a whip or in modern times you'll see some of the Muslim communities when they flog somebody they will take a metal pole or a wooden pole and they will beat that person to the flesh is ripped off of their back. So when Luke writes and says that they were told not to preach, not to teach, not to talk about God, and they were flogged and they went out, I don't want you just to say, well, that must have been a very simple act. No. You see, because what he's trying to focus in on is this, what's going to happen after they were beaten. It says this, it says that they were told not to do this, and they released them. And then they went out from the presence of Sanhedrin. Now, if you had been beaten... I don't know if any of you have been beat by your mom and daddy. I know this generation we have now uh, doesn't, you know, we right now, what are we? We're the generation that says, okay, honey, let's talk about it. You know, oh, you don't want to do, daddy, you don't want to do that? Okay. I mean, we're in the generation that the children run the parents a lot of times instead of the parents being in control of the child. But if you've ever had a spanking, how many of you ever had a spanking that was so bad that you couldn't even sit down? Uh, you know, sometimes children don't even realize that there are some people that have post-traumatic uh, stress because when they see a clothes uh, hanger, they think, oh, I can remember that time that they undid the clothes hanger and spanked me with a clothes hanger. Or they see a belt. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking about some things that, you know, back in the day, young people now have no clue about what a spanking is. Uh, when I was living in Wallace, my grandparents, the worst thing I could ever hear my grandma say is go in the backyard and get you a switch and bring it to me. 
Oh, it took me forever to find a switch. I mean, now there's plenty of switches out there, but it took me forever because I thought, well, maybe if I take a long enough time, she'll forget about this. You know, here what we see, though, is that this time that there have been we get a spanking or a whooping, you know, whooping is what we call it in the South, but whenever we get something like that, I've never seen a child after they have been, lit- I mean, whooped, beaten, that that child just jumps up and says, well, praise the Lord, I- I'm just ready to go again. You would look at them and think, something's not right about it. I, I-, I will tell you this, is that I can remember when I was about maybe seven or eight years old, I can remember finding out there was a, a curse word that I not, would never repeat, but there was a curse word that I had learned on the school bus. And I told my dad, uh, I called him that curse word. And I can remember two beatings or spankings that my father gave me. And one of them was because of that. I looked him in the face. I didn't realize what that word was. And I said, you know what? I bet you're a blankety blank. And he beat me so bad that I could not sit down on my butt for several hours. And when I would sit down, I sure didn't say, well, praise the Lord, this feels so good. No. So when you think about them being flogged and beaten, take the worst spanking you've ever had and think of this. That was nothing. That was nothing compared to what these men are going through. And you know, Many times when you've been spanked, isn't it because you deserved a spanking? Right? These men didn't deserve to be beat, but yet they were beat because of the gospel. Here what we see, though, is after they've been beaten, probably there was parts of their back, the flesh, that was hanging off. There might have been to the point that blood was pouring down to their back. They had been stripped naked. They had been humiliated. But it says in our text, it says, when they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, not the next day, not the next year, not the next decade, but it says right after they've been beaten, what happens? It says that they don't go out moaning and complaining, but they go out and it says they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy and to be dishonored on behalf of the name of Jesus. And every day that it says in the temple complex, then various homes, they continue to teach and proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, what happens is that they realize, did they hurt? Yes, they hurt. Did the pain, was it still there? Yes, it was still there. But when they got up to preach and even when they were hurting, they'd think of this. Imagine what Jesus went through for me. The least I can do is still be faithful enough for him, even if it means that I might get whipped or beaten also. These men knew that they were in danger, but they also knew that God was greater than the danger that they faced. These men who had been with Jesus had already been told that this could happen. If you have your Bibles and want to turn over now to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. Look at Matthew chapter 10. How many of you know that what happened to Peter and what happened to the others, that this was actually prophesied by Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, starting with verse 16 through 22, Jesus says this, Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and harmless as doves, because people will hand you over to the Sanhedrin. Who were handed over to Sanhedrin? The ones we just talked about. When did this happen? Jesus is talking about it in Matthew's gospel way before it actually happened. Jesus says, they'll hand you over to Sanhedrin. They'll flog you in their synagogues. Did that happen? We just read it. They'll flog you in the synagogues and beware of them. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and that of of the nations. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you should speak, for you will be given what to say at that hour, because you are not speaking, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. Brothers will betray brother to death, father his child. Children will even rise up against their parents and have them put to death. But you... You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end 
shall be saved. And when they persecute you in the one town, escape to another. For I assure you, you will not have covered the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. Is it enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his master? If they call the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more of the members of his household? Did Jesus prophesied that what was going to take place? Yes. And what did he tell them to do? Face it with joy, knowing they're doing it for him. Does that mean we go out looking for a fight? No. But when a fight comes, understand this, it is not they fighting against us, but it's their spirit fighting against the spirit that is in us. Sometimes we get it all mixed up. We think it's that individual that we have problems with. It's not the individual. The individual was created in the image of God. The person that we're having problems with is the devil, the devil that is in them. Some people will disagree with this statement, and that's fine if you do. But you're either filled with the Holy Ghost or you're filled with an anti-spirit of Christ, the anti-Christ that is in you. You're either filled with the love of God or you're filled with the hate of this world. So what do we know? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, if you have your Bible still open and want to turn over it, Matthew 5, it's amazing what takes place in verse 44. I'm not going to read it word for word, but you'll have it there and you can mark it for later. Jesus says this, Jesus tells them, I tell you this, but I tell you that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Two key things. One is that you will have enemies if you are a follower of Christ. You cannot be in this world and be passionate about Jesus and this world stay silent. If you preach the gospel, the world will hate you. But understand this, it hated our Savior before it ever hated us. If you are a friend of the world and you have had no friction with the world, my question is, how strong is your testimony? If you can walk into the group of the world and you blend right in, then my question to you is this, is there any difference in us and the world? When we walk in to the group that is worldly, that is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-church, anti-traditional marriage, when we walk into a group like that, it's something should shake and stir because our spirit is not going to be in the same accord with their spirits. And if it does, it something is wrong. If you sit there in the church and you hear your pastor say, it's okay for a man to marry a man or a woman to marry a woman. It's okay for a person to, if they don't want the baby to have an abortion. Oh, it's okay not to have to worry about reading your Bible. It's okay not to come to church. It's okay to live like the world and get drunk and go to bed with all different kinds of people. My friends, today you need to get up and get out of that kind of place. Because what's happening is that the spirit that they are proclaiming off of the pulpit area into the pews, it is like seeds being thrown into your life. And they're not the kind of seeds that you want to take root. My friends, far too often we've been silent because we don't want to hurt feelings. It's not about hurting feelings. It's about seeing lives transformed. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8. You might say, well, what about the persecution, Pastor? If persecution comes, do you believe today in this church that we're living in a time in 2020 that persecution for the believers of Jesus Christ will get worse? The answer is yes. Right now, we know for a fact there will be doctrine that will be brought into public schools that will be so anti-church and anti-Christ that there will be churches that will rise up and say this, isn't it time that we start our own Christian school? Isn't it time that we pull out of the public education because we don't want little Johnny, who is our son, to be in the locker room changing clothes with a person that is of an opposite uh, gender and just because they say that they are a boy and they're actually a girl, do you really want them in there? I have a daughter that is in middle school and right now the way it is set up in the state of North Carolina. It is illegal if a boy dresses up and puts on a dress and makeup and he says, I want to play on a sports team with the girls. It is illegal for us to say they can't. My friends, I will tell you this. God created boys to be boys and girls to be girls. You can put a dress on a boy. You can put a wig on a boy. You can put makeup on a boy. And the only thing you have there is a pre-Halloween costume. 
That's what it is. Should boys be participating and playing against girls and girls' sports? No. But in North Carolina, what we have is that if a boy wears a dress and a boy identifies as a girl, he can go in the locker room with your little girl and change clothes with her at P.E. And if you say something or to do something about it, you're the bad guy. Well, my friends, today we need more people to stand up and say something so we don't have just silent majority there and not doing something. We do have elected officials that are Christians and believers, but what happens is they put their neck out and they try to defend prayer. They try to defend traditional marriage. They try to defend these little girls who want to change their clothes without this little boy going in there with them. And no one stands behind them. What will we do? Will we stand up? Or will we lay down and let the world continue to destroy us? Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39 says the following. If this doesn't encourage you, something's wrong. What then are we to say about these things? What things? The things that are happening. If God be for us, what does it say? Who can be against us? Maybe you need to mark that in your Bible because sometimes you've forgotten that God is for you when you are following Him. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for all. How will he not also will with him grant us everything? Who can bring accusations against God's elect? Trust me, in these last days they will attack you. They will lie about you. They will try to destroy your character. They will try to get you fired from your job. They will try to do everything they can to destroy you. But my friends, today I will tell you this, that what they do to you is nothing compared to what they did to Jesus. And we should remain faithful to the very end. It says, God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God, and He intercedes for us. It is God who intercedes. It is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, that intercedes. It's not a pope. It's not a rabbi. It's not a Southern Baptist preacher. God Almighty has his son Jesus that goes to him and says, these are your followers. These are my brothers and sisters. It is Jesus. And it says this, continuing, he also is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us. And then verse 35, one that I've marked in so many different Bibles. Who can separate us? Who can separate us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus, our Lord? Who can separate us? Maybe you mark in your Bibles and you write something. Maybe you're going through a hardship at work. Maybe you need to write that scripture down in a notebook and leave out the word who and put that person's name there that's at work that is constantly trying to get you fired or get you in trouble because of your belief that's different than maybe the company's belief. You see, it's popular today to go with the crowd, but I'll let you know this, just because it's a crowd doesn't mean that it's true. It is better to preach the gospel to one or two, and one or two truly make it to heaven than it is to preach the gospel to thousands, and those thousands have polluted the gospel and prostituted it. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Think about the ones being attacked now. Think about all the radical organizations that are in this world right now. Can they, if you put their names there, can they separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer my day is no, they cannot. Then he goes on and says, Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword... As it is written, because you are being put to death all the day long, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors. Some scripture says that we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life or angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or death or anything created... So what you're going through right now, can you fill it into any of those categories? The answer, I'm sure, is yes. It says anything created will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do we have? We have this idea that even though we might be going through persecution and hardship, we're not going through it alone. Doesn't it make it easier knowing that whatever you face... Tomorrow, you will face it with Jesus. 
If you're a believer in Christ, I want to encourage you before we leave this place to know this, is that when you stand up and you tell someone, this is the good news, you can do that. And I've had people say, well, I'm afraid to share my faith. Don't be afraid to share your faith. Because remember this, there was someone who shared their faith in Jesus Christ to you and shared the gospel to you is the reason why you have hope in the same Jesus that I have hope in. And so don't be... And you might say, well, Pastor, I might get all the words all tangled up. Pastor, I don't have a college degree. Pastor, I might not be able to pronounce the word just right and that's in the Bible. I will let you know that if we believe the Scripture, the Scripture said this, is that when the time comes and you've got to open your mouth, that the Holy Spirit will get inside of you and the words that come out will be His and not yours. You see, whenever I try to get involved in something, when I try to take over, when I try to make it about me, it fails every single time. But whenever I let God just simply take over and say, God, let me be your mouthpiece. God, let me be the hands that you want me to be on this earth. God, I'm not perfect. I will fail. God, I will mess up. God, I will probably disappoint you at times. Will you please, dear Lord, please let me have the honor to simply tell someone about Jesus. One day you're going to get to heaven and you're going to see people there that might come up to you and say, Hey, did you know I'm here? Yes, because of Jesus. Yes, I'm here because of what Jesus has done. But God Almighty used you to share the gospel with me. I saw the life you were living. I saw the testimony you had. And it encouraged me to want to know more about Jesus. Wouldn't it be good to get to heaven and someone come to you and hug your neck and say, I'm here because you told me about Jesus. But you see, some of us might get to heaven and never bump into anyone that we ever told about the Savior. Will you go to heaven if you don't tell anyone about Jesus? Oh, yeah. There's different levels of rewards, different stars in your crown. Not everyone's going to be a Billy Graham. Not everyone's going to be in a worldwide evangelist. But you can be you. You can be you. Your style of doing evangelism might be different than my style of doing it. Does it make it wrong? No, as long as it's biblical. But you don't need to be so wrapped up about what will I say and what scripture will I use. Do you and should you be prepared? Yes. But don't try to get so prepared that you don't let the Holy Spirit take over when the time comes. Oh, friends, I've gone and there was times I visited people's homes. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. I had the speech already written out in my head and how I was going to lead and how I was going to do. And and then what happens, just like a lot of sermons I get prepared to preach, that God just comes in and says, okay, you did a good job prepared. Now you need to step to the side and let me do what I do. Don't you know when that happens, things work out so much better when it's the other way around and we tell God, Will you step aside and let me do what I need to do? Amen. Let me give you this and we'll close. I wrote down this statement that I think that when you leave here, how many of you know sometimes you hear a 30-minute sermon, 40-minute sermon, sometimes even a five-minute sermon, and only one thing will stand out to your mind? That happens a lot. Let me give you one thing that I believe should stand out to you. These men of God that were drug into the Sanhedrin court, these men of God who were going to be killed if it hadn't have been for God using Gamaliel, these men of God who were there and being persecuted, they were persecuted because that they were doing something. My statement to you is this I want you to think of. And when I say this, I knew when I wrote it down, and I didn't write it down to this morning. I had just got done loving on the baby. Jessica was doing what she needed to do, and she went in there and took the baby, and she was loving and doing what she needs to do with the baby. And I was sitting on the couch, and I pulled out my little notepad, because a lot of times something will come to you. You ever have something just come to you, you need to write it down? And so it came to me, and and I wrote it down. I said, Lord, I I don't need to say this. And that's what I was thinking. Lord, I don't need to say what I just wrote down. And then the more I thought about it, I said, Lord, if you put it on my heart to say, I better say it. And here it is. 
If you can't follow Jesus Christ and be faithful to the gospel when everything is going good, how in the world do you plan to be a faithful follower of Christ with all the problems, pain, and persecution that's about to happen? If you can't come to church when the sun is out, how are you going to come to church when there's a storm? If you can't pray whenever your knees are still able to get down, how many of you are able to still get down on your knees? If you're not willing to get on your knees when your knees are working, how many of you are going to get down on your knees when it don't work? If you're not willing to give to the gospel financially when you have money, how are you going to be able to have a giving spirit when you have nothing? If you're not willing, whenever your body is able to go to one house or another and knock on the door and God still give you the breath in your body to share a testimony, if you won't do it whenever you're healthy, will you do it when you're sick? The point I'm getting at is that you say, Oh, I'll be faithful to God. I'll be faithful. No, you won't. You won't. If we're so wrapped up in the world now, how in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, are we going to be faithful when we get persecuted? There will come a time that there will be people that are left behind and they will have a choice to either accept the mark of the beast and if they do not accept the number 666, and I thought at one time growing up it was going to be like the branding iron, but with technology today they can take a needle with a grain of sand as small as that is with a microchip put in it. They can put it in the palm of your hand or your forehead and what will happen is you cannot buy or sell without that mark. You think today that what? all these signs and I thought it was just just somewhere else but I even saw in Burgall a sign that says that it used the exact change because we don't have any coins what is taking place is that we are gradually seeing wake up we're gradually seeing the mark of the beast going to be slowly integrated where all cash currency is done away with and what are we doing we are right here at the labor pains we're right here watching this happen and if it's happening, then persecution is going to come because what's going to happen when you stand up and say, no, no. Do I know when Jesus is coming back? No, I do not. But the Bible says we can know the season even though we don't know the hour. I can go outside and tell you that it's the right season for certain fruit to produce, can't you? I can walk outside and look and see all the world events that are happening. The government has already learned they can control us. The government has learned they can control the church. The government has learned that they can say, you can't do this, you can't do that, and we will be like sheep and do it. But my friends, what will happen when we stand up and say, no, we're going to sing even if they tell us not to sing. No, we're going to preach even though they tell us not that we can't preach. We're still going to share something of a scripture on Facebook. There's coming a day, I believe, that when putting a scripture passage on Facebook will be, you'll get flagged and say this is inappropriate because it could offend someone. Are you still willing to do what is called to be done, even if it means that you're drug in front of everyone downtown, stripped naked and beaten because of the gospel? I pray to God I never have to find that out. Don't you? But I close with a statement. Tommy, come on up. I close with a statement. I pray I never have to be tested to know if I would be faithful to the good news of Jesus. If somebody were to start ripping my shirt and my coat off and they said, don't preach anymore about Jesus and they, or we're going to beat you, I, I pray that my faith you know, right now it's easy to say, well, oh, oh, here's what I would do. I pray, God, will you please allow me to remain faithful. I pray, God, that you allow me to be faithful, not only when things are good, but, Lord, when all hell has bust loose on this earth, that I will still remain faithful. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, today I'm going to ask you this question. Are you faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? Are you faithful to the gospel message? Are you faithful in your attendance? Are you faithful in your giving? Are you faithful in your prayers? Are you faithful in your testimony? Are you faithful? 
And you might say, well, I could do a lot better and maybe I'm not as faithful as I should. But my friends, when things are so non-confrontational as they've been in the past, if we can't be faithful now, how in the Lord's name when we look at Jesus Christ as our Savior face to face, how will we be like Stephen when he was being stoned, the first deacon of the church to look up to heaven? How can we still have enough confidence that even though they might crucify this flesh that yet we shall still live? Today, if you doubt one bit that you would be faithful, you say, well, Pastor, I sure hope so. Friends, leave here today boldly knowing no matter what they do to you that you'll be faithful. The thing that breaks my heart knowing this is that the enemy knows exactly what to do and how to attack you. Do you believe that? The enemy knows that he can beat you and that you would not recant the faith. But then the enemy knows that you love that little boy or that little girl of yours so much that if they get to the point that somebody's going to beat them or hurt them or kill them, that you might step back and say, I won't preach the gospel anymore. Please don't hurt them. Friends, we've got to be faithful regardless of what happens. We can lose it all on this earth, but I promise you, you'll never lose Jesus. You can lose your health, you can lose your wealth, you can lose family and friends, but you'll never lose Jesus because nothing will separate you from the love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.